So I'm going to bring on uh, Shelby from um, in college higher higher ed experience. Shelby, you should be able to unmute yourself. Are you there? Yep, I am here. Okay, it Let me says find you. There you yes. Go. Okay. And can I share my screen? Yep. Hold on. There you go. It's all you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. Play from start. Okay. Does it look right? You can yep. see it? Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Shelby with the Colorado Initiative for Inclusive Higher Ed. Lucas, right? We go by in. It's much easier, much shorter. So that works just great. Um, so I'm going to talk about opportunities for students with intellectual disabilities to go to college. You'll have a copy of the slides. So if you think, wow, these have a lot of text, it's really so you'll have notes later. So you don't have to like frantically write things down or take pictures of slides or whatever. So just know they'll be there. Um, so we were founded in 2014 by really a group of parents interested in college options for their loved ones. We've grown into our own nonprofit since then with actual staff. Um, and there are now actual opportunities for college for students with intellectual disabilities in Colorado. A few years ago, that was not the case. So these are very new. Um, the programs are in their fifth year right now. So I'm gonna talk about that as we go. Some of the things I wanted to just highlight briefly based on what I'd heard at the beginning is one, if you are someone on who has a student who's, or just an individual in your life who's older, um, maybe they've already graduated from high school or the school district transition program, that is totally okay. They would be welcome to go back to college if it was something they were interested in. And that's something that we have seen over, over the years especially if the opportunity wasn't there when they graduated. The other thing I wanna point out is the series you're doing really talks about a lot of great resources and many of those can be used if, you, if your student would go to college as well. And um, so going to college wouldn't rule them out of accessing, like you'll talk about Medicaid waivers or their division of vocational rehabilitation or really many of the things you talk about. Um, so I just wanted to kind of touch on those. I won't go into very much about those and how it relates to college, but just your takeaway would be a lot of those resources can still be available. All right. So the reason our organization was founded is because graduation can often be like falling off a cliff where Families don't know what's next. Students don't know what's next. Um, in many cases, students might be saying they want to go to college, but have been told it wasn't possible or they wouldn't be accepted. A lot of different things happening. And so we kind of look at college as this way to bridge the gap into adult life where you, you know, work on taking classes in your specific area of interest for your career that you would like when you graduate from college. Um, and it also gives students, you know, that time for some more independence, just like with any other student that would go to college. So that freedom to be independent, um, to be on their own. So that's kind of where this comes from. It is not just the college experience, but very much setting students up for success into their adult life in whatever career they've chosen to pursue. So some of the impacts of inclusive higher education are increased wages. So students who have gone on to these sorts of pathways, um, these sorts of programs that I'll talk about exist across the country in every state now. And so we've seen that students do experience a significant increase in wages. They also experience an increase in job diversity. So nationally, they've seen that there's been a 300% increase in the healthcare profession. So that would be individuals with intellectual disabilities who are taking professions within that healthcare field. There's also been a steep decrease in food preparation industries and in cleaning and maintenance occupations. So really that opportunity for college has really shifted what opportunities are available for individuals with intellectual disabilities. And then on more of that kind of what else do you get as an individual when you go to college? Students do have more social relationships and are more likely to live on their own and rent their own home as opposed to living with mom and dad. Um, and as a sibling to someone with an intellectual disability, that's always the most exciting to me is really that opportunity for that greater independence. And so that's just some of the context. I'm going to go in now to just what does it actually look like? There are three schools in Colorado with these options. They are University of Northern Colorado. Their office is called Goal. Elevate is at Arapahoe Community College. 
Um, if you're in that uh, kind of Arapahoe County Parker area, there's actually a bus that goes right down um, Arapaho Road. So it goes directly down Arapaho Road and takes you right to ACC. So I know many students use that option. The light rail also goes to ACC. So it can be a really nice local option if students don't want to move away. And then there is the Office of Inclusive Service at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, which also from the Arapaho Douglas area is kind of a nice, just like hour, hour and a half drive south. So for students, who would be admitted, they just have to have a documented intellectual or developmental disability. They do not need to meet the other entry criteria such as an SAT or ACT score. Um, some schools ask for an essay, other schools ask for specific high school classes or a GPA that the student has. That does not apply for this, this pathway. This uh, inclusive higher education offers an alternate pathway to enrollment. The second biggest thing is the student has to have a desire to go to college. It really has to be their desire where they really have that interest to live and work as independently as possible. I know that can be hard sometimes where um, parents or guardians might really want their individual in their life to go to college, but really it has to be this person saying, I want to go to college and this is why. The student does not have to be at the, the college grade level. Um, this really is, is designed to kind of work with students wherever they're at. So whether that is, you know, an elementary reading and writing level, whether that's middle school, wherever the student is, it's really, again, about their desire to go. With that, what makes inclusive higher education really unique is that students can access modifications Generally in college, they're not able to access modifications, um, but many students with intellectual disabilities use those throughout their time in the K-12 education system. So some of those examples for modifications would be things like having, um, instead of a 10-page paper, a student might do a one-page paper, or maybe instead of presenting in front of the class, the student is doing a recording of, of their presentation. Other students, instead of taking a final written exam, are doing a multiple choice exam. So it looks a little different for the student and what their needs are, but just kind of know that that is available. Um, the student needs to be 18. Some students have attended their school district transition program and that is also totally fine. For some students that works really well and that is their choice. And for other students, they prefer to go right to college. So it really is up to the family and the student. And so the students would apply directly to the inclusive service office on campus. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second because I think maybe there's a chat. Let me see if they want to go. Yeah, other transportation options. That's a great question. Um, I would say public transit is probably the, the biggest option that students use. So the bus and the light rail. Um, yeah, I don't, many students do not drive who are on this pathway. And so that is not a problem. The schools can also work with you to talk about more individual options. Um, definitely students have used their, their Medicaid waivers to get some transportation training like that summer before they go to school or even through the school district. So there's lots of options to kind of address how the individual will, will get there. Um, you could also look at setting up, you know, different transportation that might be out there for folks with disabilities. Um, so I'm happy to connect uh, offline as well if I'm not answering that question. Um, but yeah. I see another question is about if someone has a developmental disability, so something maybe like autism. That's a great question, and this really varies on the person. If this student would be accepted traditionally to college, meaning that they, you know, maybe have taken that SAT and ACT, they have the traditional high school diploma, they've taken the prereq classes, then this pathway would not be for them. But there are some other options out there. There are what are called comprehensive transition programs. These are available at CSU, so Colorado State University, at University of Denver, and at Metro State University in Denver. Um, so I can send a sheet out with those as well to make sure that you all can see those if, if you're thinking someone might not qualify for this pathway but still need some of those additional maybe vocational or social supports. 
Another question is about trade schools. Also a good question. That is something we're really interested in expanding. So the schools I listed before are the first three in Colorado and there will be more. That is part of what we exist as a nonprofit to do. The schools run the services themselves. Um, we're really here to do education and outreach and to also look at expansion to other schools. So the answer is right now we don't have a trade school, but we're really hoping to see trade schools open their doors to these sorts of paths. And then another great question about cost, which I believe I have a slide. So I'm gonna move this chat box and I will keep going on what it looks like. This map just shows you students really are from across the state. Some students are living on campus. And again, they're really kind of making that leap to travel from across the state. This year is really exciting. There are five students from out of state who have chosen this option as well. That's just that. Um, for the academics, students usually take two classes from the course catalog of their choice. So if a student, for example, is studying, um, you know, a couple students who are in like government, so they might be taking a couple political science classes. Other students who are maybe in that healthcare field are maybe taking certified nurse aid courses. Other students might be in education and taking some teaching courses. It really depends on what their interests are and, um, kind of, yeah, really just their interest in what they're specializing in. Then there's one specialized class, which is the only class where students with intellectual disabilities are required to be together in that class. They're working a lot on different things like maybe social skills, independent living skills, budgeting, um, different financial skills, things where maybe it's not explicitly taught in college, but it's really helpful to know that information. So that's a specialized class that meets just once per week. Students earn a comprehensive higher education certificate because of the modifications in their courses. They are not able to apply the credit towards a bachelor's degree. And so I always stress that really this option is for students who would not otherwise be in college and really have that college dream. Their classes are taken for credit. They're graded like anyone else. And so that's that aspect. In terms of support, peer mentors play a really critical piece. There are other college students who are trained um, some are studying special education, some are not. It really depends on the peer mentor and what role they're filling. For the academic component, it looks a little different at each school, but sometimes the peer mentor will go to class with a student to kind of take notes and then check in with the student afterwards on what some of the main topics were from class. If it's a group work heavy class, the peer mentor might help the student engage um, just within that group work setting. Other peer mentors might run a study hall or other check-ins throughout the week where students can drop in and get some more academic support. Students can also act, oh, sorry, access any other resource on campus, whether that's a tutoring center or a writing center or anything like that. Some of the things students are studying are listed here. So things like brewing studies, criminal justice, dance, journalism, advocacy, students are in art, photography, across the board. This is an example of what the certificate looks like. So it's showing you that students are taking, again, those three classes per semester, which is less than your, your traditional student. Um, your traditional student might take four or five courses, but it's really been found that for students on this pathway, three for three classes is pretty, pretty a full load. Um, the other key component is the career aspect. So in the first year, students are doing a lot of career exploration, looking at doing job tours, other visits to potential employers, really getting a sense of what is it specifically they want to do. My favorite example is a student who maybe wants to go in um, to something where they're working within kind of like the counseling field or human services, but maybe they haven't articulated what population they want to work with. So do they want to be in the hospital or maybe in substance use or foster care or within the school setting? So that first year is really helping to kind of hone in on those specific interests. The second year then students are doing more with on-campus employment, a lot of students have never had a job. So that second year really allows for kind of those foundational job skills with different on-campus jobs. Um, and sometimes that'll be within their area of study. So like for early childhood education, I know some students who have been in the early childhood center on campus. Um, other students have been like within the dining hall or someone else was interested in library science. So her work was within the library at the school. 
The third and fourth year is where it gets more exciting and students are having paid and unpaid internships and other work experiences on and off campus really in line with what they want to do with the idea that they transition into competitive integrated employment when they're done. So I know that's a really brief overview, um, but really I just want you to get a sense of kind of what, what it looks like and then you can always look into it um, um, in the future. I know every year we have someone who has gone through this, this um, step up series who has applied and gone on to higher education. So if you're thinking, ah, I just don't know, it might not be for my students, I think that there's a good chance that it might be if they're interested in college. And so I talked about the internships. In May of this year, so 2020, there were the first graduates in Colorado. So we had six in our state. We're really excited kind of to see what happens. It's a little hard to say right now because of COVID, um, but they all do have, have employment. It just looks a little different than I think they, they were thinking. So I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. The last component is the social piece. This is again where peer mentors play a really big role in working with students to get involved. So whether that is just kind of like, how do you join a club? Or maybe that is like, how do you go to the dining hall? Or maybe you wanna to go to a party and you're not really sure what that looks like. And so you'd like some additional support from a peer instead of, you know, an adult. Uh, I, well, they're, they're adults, they're young adults, but you know, you don't want someone who's like maybe significantly older than you asking you about, you know, going to a party. It's really that peer to peer engagement to make it very natural in terms of what the support looks like. Some students also, once they join clubs, um, or even a couple students have joined fraternities, will say that they've received more support from those avenues and so don't need as much support. My favorite is parents who tell me their student is not coming home on the weekend because they're too busy with their social engagements. And so the social piece is really a critical piece, but, but I like to leave it last because I think it's the most important to know that inclusive higher education goes beyond the social piece and really does focus on that academic and um, vocational component. So for independence, students at UNC are able to live in the dorms. And then in their junior and senior year, if, if they choose, they are able to live off campus or in apartments or other housing. So that's been really cool over the last couple of years to see students really just saying, hey, I met these friends through this group, I'd like to live with them in this other setting. Um, so that is one option if students want to move away. And then they can live in apartments at UCCS. Again, they can use the Medicaid waiver. So that's a very brief piece. I wanna make sure we get the financial info. So students are paying tuition and fees. There is a program fee for inclusive services and then room and board. So it often is very similar to what it would be for any other college student. So the tuition and fees are less because students are taking less classes, but you do have that additional program fee. Um, there is ability to access financial aid. Students can also look at using the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation as a funding avenue, especially if in, um, in terms of financial need, that can be a really helpful avenue for families to look into. I talked a bit about the community center boards and Medicaid waivers. Um, other students have applied their social security income towards college. So there's a lot of avenues. This can be a little tricky. So if you are feeling like the financial piece might be the biggest barrier, definitely reach out. You can reach out to myself or the schools directly, and we would be happy to provide more info on what this looks like for different families because it, it kind of is piecing together like aspects that already exist for college students, such as financial aid, which can include grants, which don't have to be repaid. And it can also include things like work study. Um, but on the other side, there are some disability specific funding sources and even scholarships that we can help kind of navigate that path. So I know that's not always the most ideal thing to hear. I think, you know, it'd be great if it was really like cut and dry, but just know um, if the financial piece is the biggest barrier and someone really wants to go to college, we would love to chat more about what that can look like. So I have some slides I'm preparing for college, but I think that is all of my time. So you're welcome to send me questions. Here's my contact info. We have an executive director and then here's me, Shelby. So I'm really grateful for your time. And again, it was a very brief overview. So if you have more questions, feel free to reach out directly. Um, and I'll stay on for a couple minutes if you wanna like direct chat me a message, but I don't wanna take away from other people. So that is that. Thank you so much, Luke. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. have a good or night. Shall we, and 
Um, if anyone has like a quick, a few questions now, we do have a few minutes built in for a question or two. I do want to highlight that this, the waiver programs don't, do not pay for any of this. They can be utilized up at college, meaning they can have someone that can help with some personal care or mentorship, or if they are up in Greeley, we can get them into, um, you know, some support employment or, you know, a day program or, you know, waiver supports up in their, wherever they're going to school, but the waivers itself aren't paying for any of that. Yep. That is great clarification. I know one of the questions was a lot of our kids have a para help. Um, are these schools open to para therapist help? Uh, yes, there is not really an equivalent of a para for a college. The students, I think the peer mentor is really the closest aspect that students would have for that. Um, yeah, yeah, so there, there's not 24 seven support. Students do have to have some independence on like the weekends or the evenings. They can still check in with peer mentors, but there isn't someone that's, that's that exact support. Um, so I hope that answers the question. If someone, if you want to clarify, if that didn't make sense, let me know. Um, no, I think that helps. I mean, this is, yeah, aimed for individuals that have some independent skills that would like to continue their education. Um, we bring it in to step up for the reason of it, it wasn't around a few years ago and some of your loved ones um, could definitely do some college um, and do some of this. And college, again, isn't always the academic part um, with what you get out of college. It's a lot of the interaction and social skills you learn there of you know, how not to be a teenager anymore, how to be a little more independent, how mom and dad aren't doing things for you. Um, and so as we talked about, services are built so that you know, people are helping them be able to do things as independently as possible. And this is one of those programs. Shelby, did you have anything else to close us out? No, I think that's it. But really, if you're thinking, you know, college isn't an option, um, or if teachers have told you that in some cases, a lot of times that's kind of the student that the pathway is designed for. When I hear from parents that they think this would be a perfect fit, it's often more of like, mm, your student might actually be traditionally accepted. This is really getting at families and students who have thought college isn't possible and providing that additional support. So that's kind of all I've got. Well, thank you so much.